Okay, uh, today's topics, I will talk about long-term investing in technology companies and I will go through my top holdings and then for each of these top holdings, I will mention, uh, I'll touch on, on, let's say like their earnings, their uh, operating results and the long-term uh, prospect of all these companies. Uh, today's presentation is a bit long, so there are quite a number of uh, slides, so let's get started. Now, I just want to touch on the, my philosophy of long-term investing. So this channel, right, I've set up uh, for three years plus already. And this is the first video that I created um, three years ago, I think late 2020. Until now, um, the number of views right, isn't that high, uh, only 595 views. And I think in, in that first video, I already share my entire portfolio. And this is uh, the statement from Interactive Brokers. And I, I just want to point out something here, right? If you look at the... Um, the companies that I have, I have invested back then, right? You see the uh, companies like Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, TSMC, and then you look at the details here. Of course, um, there are some names that I'm holding and some I already divested. For example, Apple, I'm still holding, Amazon, still holding, Alibaba, divested, uh, Berkshire, still holding, Salesforce, still holding, Meta, divested, uh, Microsoft, Nvidia, Tencent, Tesla, TSMC, all these still holding. Uh, C and Square, I've divested now. So I just want to share with you all, like, you know, since three years ago, I've been holding these companies and till now I'm still holding. So really I, I'm like, you know, on, on my Telegram chat group, I also mentioned that this is really like uh, invest for the long term, right? I, I really plan to hold these companies for very long. Um, as long as, I mean, their long term thesis is still around, I'll still keep holding. For those that have divested, right, you can say that, okay, I panic sell and so on. Okay, I, I think that's true. But uh, the, the way I reason that is that some, some of these companies, when we bought, right, we still don't know whether um, they will turn out to be something in line with our expectations. So some, some of them is like we, our thesis is wrong uh, and so we need to adjust from time to time, right? But I believe that uh, for most companies, we shouldn't, you know, like the entire portfolio, we shouldn't in and out, in and out, you know? We should really focus on like focusing on the long-term thesis and then as long as the long-term thesis is still intact we, we should keep holding on and you can see that from from my uh, investment result you can see that the result isn't that bad especially for those that that play well of course there will be some companies that isn't isn't doing that well but assuming that i mean the money that you put into the companies will at most you can lose 100 percent of that capital right but if you if it turn out well it can go up the 100x no sorry, 2x, 3x. So I, I think you can see that the, the result is, is not symmetry. Um, downside is like cap, but upside is, is not cap, right? I think that's the good thing about long-term investing. Okay, so how to tie this so-called long-term investing um, versus the company that, that I own, right? So I remember there's this speech uh, given by Jeff Bezos. So basically this, this is the most important uh, uh, quote from him. Like he said that I very frequently get the questions, what's going to change in the next 10 years? And that's very interesting questions. And it's a very common one. I almost never get the questions, what's not going to change in the next 10 years? So I, I just want to point out that for many companies that we invest, right? Our brain, we tend to ask like, What's the catalyst, right? What, what will change over the next, let's say, three months, six months, one year, right? Because we are, we are very impatient. We want things to happen fast. Uh, it's not enough to get hot, you know, but we want to hot very soon. Like you cannot even wait for three months, six months. So that's a very, I would say, common mindset. Uh, but the thing is, if you keep on focusing on what's going to change over the next uh, three, three to six months, then you need to keep on reviewing. For example, let's say there's a catalyst okay, a company they want to invest. And then after six months or after one year, you suddenly realize that the catalyst isn't there anymore. Then you need to, you know, like, okay, uh, take your capital out and then invest another company with, with, with a different catalyst, right? So you will keep on chasing all these uh, companies. I, I don't know what we are counting on. Are we counting on luck that you just get on and then the whole thing's just, uh, you know, like 2x, 3x, 5x within short period of time and then you just want to cash out, right? This, this type of really uh, short-term mindset, I, I think that is... Um, I'm not saying it's bad investment. I'm just saying that if you keep doing that, right, you will keep on feeling this restless feeling where you need to keep chasing. Whereas someone who just, you know, like focus on the uh, long-term prospect, they will just hold on to the companies. Uh, and, and some of these companies, their thesis, right, can last for, you know, like 5, 10, 15 years. And you, most of the time, you just sit there and do nothing and let the entire portfolio compound, right? So that's what tr I'm trying to you know, share like at least my approach is like focus on the long term 
and, and so you you can you know like just sit sit tight and do nothing and just enjoy the gains uh but but you need to be patient uh, i think that's the thing the question is right like i i comparing like you know things that is like within one year okay which is short term right versus things that is you know like uh, five ten years what what are things that that are not going to change that that we are we should focusing on right so i'll give a few examples here the first one is that for the companies that you we, we all invest right we need to spot like what are the long-term trend that will likely persist um over long period of time okay uh you need to sp- because this will be specific to the certain industry uh certain sectors uh, and whether the companies that we want to pick right are they winning in in that kind of trend we, we want to be very clear about that uh. and usually this kind of trend right uh even for technology trend or, or some of the trend isn't uh, technology trend but still they can they can last very long so for focusing on those uh, long-term trend then second thing is that um company culture and and their principles uh this is even more interesting because uh for companies you, you, you notice right uh, for companies that we have been following right their culture the way they do things is usually very unique and they don't tend to change uh from time to time they are they are kind of rigid because maybe um you know the founders infuse those culture and principle into the company for many many years and so even the founder uh left the companies right the culture will still stick i, I won't say that these kind of things won't change for you know like 30 50 years uh, but at least right it will not change within like three years five years time unless there's very drastic things happen for example the companies are facing a huge crisis and then there's huge turnover and then they have to reinvent their business model and so on during uh, such circumstances or, or such situations maybe the culture will change and they have to evolve uh, to, to fit uh, the new environment but for most of the companies that are winning let's say they have been winning for you know like 5 10 15 years right their culture tend to stick uh, longer uh, and, and of course, some, some of them are very explicit about their principle. And so if they have that principle, right, they will just say up front and you just need to like assess those principle and know what is the benefit and cost of those principle and see whether it fit your uh, own personal values and what you are looking for in the companies. And, and so if you focus on this, they, they won't change. Uh, f- it, at least it will, it will sustain for 10 years or, or longer. And then, of course, there are other things that they are very sticky. For example, like customer uh, behavior, their loyalty, and so on. So this is also something that will stick uh, longer than many other short-term uh, things that's happening. And then, of course, uh, the last one is that um, the, if if there's any flywheel or any network effects that's ongoing, I think all this can can last very long as well. Uh, the next one, I will go through my top holdings, and then I will just get into like each of these companies. What are the long-term um, thesis that uh, I've been you know holding on so that I, I'm, I haven't sell any uh, of these chairs okay this is my portfolio I won't go through all of them I know that it looks very messy uh, that's why I just want to focus one at a time okay the first one I will touch on is of course uh, Tesla in fact last uh, week video has been doing quite well um, actually I, I talked a lot about Tesla so here I will go a little bit more into details but isn't so much on the valuation but m- mostly on the long-term uh, trend okay Okay, before that, I will just quickly run through some of the numbers because, you know, this is uh, earnings seasons, right? Uh, all these companies, I think they have reported their uh, earnings except for NVIDIA. Uh, so we just roughly touch on that. So you look at this is uh, last 12 months uh, revenue for uh, Tesla. As you can see that they've been growing quite well. Uh, but over the past, uh, past, I mean, recent few quarters, you can see that their uh, revenue growth have, has been tapered off uh, a bit. I think mostly this is because of the uh, cut in prices. Uh, okay. Now, of course, this is the operating income. Uh, I think I showed this chart uh, last week as well. You can see that before the company scale up, uh, they, they are making losses. Uh, and then during the period uh, around COVID, I think they've been doing very well because all these car prices are very high and they are able to charge high price and still um, they, they can't meet all the demand. And recently, I think uh, the supply has been catching up and, and so they have to cut prices to, to uh, you know, make sure all their cars that have been produced able to, to, to get sold. If not, uh, they are holding too much inventory. Also, that's a big problem, right? So operating income has been coming down. Uh, is um, on last twelve month basis is at nine billion uh, dollars. Okay, those are the financial, right? Okay, financial. I would say if you focus on the financial, every quarter it will be different. Whether it's trending up, trending down. Whether the you know like all these uh car prices going up or or they have to cut price going down. And then if you ask about like what are the new stuff, right? Like you keep following Cybertruck and, and so on. This keep changing every month. 
But if you want to focus on something that is not changing every month, you need to ask yourself, right, what is not going to change for Tesla over the next 10 years? So I think this question is, is a lot more interesting and a lot more insightful to help us make a decision whether this company want to own over the long term or not. Okay, the first one is um, EV price and their cost will keep on dropping. I believe so. Uh, they, they will keep continue to cut prices and the cost will drop just because of uh, uh, technology, because of the scaling uh, of the production and so on. And I believe that EV market share will continue to increase over time. Doesn't mean that uh, Tesla shares within the EV uh, market will uh, go up. I think that it will actually come down as more and more companies uh, rolling up their uh, EVs, right? But overall, I would think that the market shares of Tesla will, will go up. They, they will be eating market shares from you know uh, companies like Ford, uh, Volkswagen, and so on, and even Toyota, right? Okay, the third one, EV charging will be faster and more convenient. Uh, this one, I'll give some more details later. And the fourth one, Tesla FSD will only get better over time. So about the Tesla FSD, I think that many people has been mocking Tesla, say that their FSD is always next year, next year, next year, right? But the, 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 there's some truth in it because still now, um, it is still, you know, like you, you can't say that they, they can drive 100% uh, of the time, right? But one thing we are sure is that these things can only get better, right? So this is also like, I, I, this is at least my belief now. Okay, let's get into more details, right? So you, you see here, this is the chart of global battery uh, electric vehicle sales. So in terms of their market shares right now, it's about like, I would say 12 to 13%, still low, uh, and it is catching up and it's taking uh, market share from ICE uh, vehicles. And then um, the, the next one is talking about the battery cost decline. You can see that, I mean, this is coming from uh, Arc Invest, their 2024 big ideas. I think some of these uh, info informations are quite helpful in, in understanding like you know the long-term prospect here you can see that all these battery costs right if they model it right basically they model what is the cost per kilowatt hours versus what is the cumulative kilowatt hours being produced so i think this is basically saying that as the uh, all these all these battery scale scaling up their cost will reduce over time now and, and this is modeled quite well here so you, you can expect that once the cost drop to a level such that the EV uh, prices is on par or lower than all these ICE vehicles, right? Um, I mean, the, the sales will skyrocket, right? So, so that's where the, you know, the, the f uh, 20, 20 millions of target sales by 2030 uh, coming from Elon. So I think this is something that will likely be true over the next, um, you know, like 10 years. Okay, the next one, I think many people who doubt about EV is that they say that, okay, you go and petrol and pump your car within like five minutes, it's done, right? And then if you use uh, charging, probably you need to still, you know, like wait 10, 20, 30 minutes, depending on, on the size of the battery. But one thing interesting I noticed is that all this charging time, right, with, with the supercharger coming uh, up, and then there's, you know, like different version, right, version two, version three, and, and so on. And you, you can see that over the next 10 years, there will be a lot more advancement in the charging, uh, in terms of the network and also the technology. And it will require less time to, to you know, like charge up uh, a mileage that is sufficient for you to drive for, let's say, like 200 miles, right? And here, these numbers here, 2023, you only need 12 minutes of charging for 200 miles. Of course, there's a lot of caveat behind these numbers. For example, uh, the charging time also isn't like fixed uh, from 0% to 100%, right? Maybe in the... Between zero to fifty percent is a lot faster compared to fifty percent uh, to hundred percent. But still, you, you see all this, right? One thing we are sure is that there will be improvement, and it will be a lot more convenient in the future. And because of all this, get, getting more convenient, more and more people will will uh, adopt EVs. Uh. I think that's something that that I believe will come true as well. Okay, the next one is uh, talking about prices. You know, as all these battery prices come down, and then um, all these you know car prices. Uh, also of EVs also coming down. We can see that Tesla Model Y and Model 3 is already um, on par with, you know, like average uh, selling car, average price of in US. So I think this is also something that is um, like, this will be a, a trend that will keep playing um, over the next 10 years. The chart on the right-hand side, you can see that is that the moment it crossed the, uh, you know, the, the pricing of, let's say, 25K, right? Uh, 30 to 25K. Uh, once it's, once the EV price cross below this range, right? I mean, the, the sales will just skyrocket because uh, most of the ICE vehicles, uh, the mainstream one, I mean, the, the, the one that's best selling one, they are actually priced around this, uh, this range. Uh. So that's the range that they need to cross over. As of now, it's still, you know, like not, not clearly 
uh, say that test, all, all this price is already below that. But I think all this will happen over the next 10 years now. So this is also something, a long-term trend that, that will be beneficial. Then of course, um, I mean, as this happened, the market share will be different. You, you see that uh, historical EV sales is the green color here. Uh, according to ARC projections, uh, it will keep going up. In my view, uh, I would just think that, okay, whether it will go up to, let's say, you know, like close to 75, 80% in 2030, I don't know. Because all this pace, right, is really based on their own projection. But at least one thing I'm sure is that it will, going, it will keep on going up. Because like the charging network, uh, all these things take time to build up. Uh, as it builds up, right, people will have less and less concern of owning EVs. So I, I think this is the long-term trend that, that is always um, beneficial to Tesla and also other uh, EVs as well. Okay, so I think this one is talking about the competitions between um, Tesla versus other uh, EV manufacturers. And it says that other um, smaller EV manufacturers, because of the, they don't have enough scale, so they will have a hard time to compete with, with the light of Tesla BYD, right? So I think this is talking about the competitions. I won't go more into the details. But one thing is that e even though like all the previous slides we are talking about, like, okay, EVs is going, going to continue to win, uh, I think this is to address to, uh, the concern that will Tesla continue to win, right? So I think at least one chart here to show that um, likely, yes. Uh, and the big ones, for example, for example, like Tesla, BYD, they will continue to, to win. The smaller one, I think, for example, China, I, I believe they have a few hundreds uh, EV uh, uh, automakers, some already in production, some are not. I think most of those companies will, will um, you know, have a hard time to survive over the coming few years. Now. Then come back to Tesla. This is coming from their earnings, right? So you can see that the um, accumulative mouse driven by FSD keep continuing to go up ex exponentially. And if that's the case, right? I, I, all this is very helpful in terms of like helping them to, to you know, make a better FSD, right? So I think this, this will only continue. Like, like you don't have to follow every quarter uh, like in, in details, right? We know that this is going to, to be true. You can almost skip all this chart uh, in, in coming quarters, right? Then of course the company is, is after all this price cut is still profitable. I believe that I don't think that they can they they, are, they have to you know like get into loss making in order to keep on selling their cars right. So I think this is uh, will, will continue to be profitable. But in terms of how much whether the profit will go down or go up, I think that's another another story. But at least on the financial side, right, I'm not worried on the financials. Okay, I think that's all about Tesla. I hope that, uh, you know, like if you look at all these long-term thesis, you can just, you know, like think, think about it, right? Like each of these companies, uh, whether you believe that this will be true, or maybe when I say all those things, you think that, okay, I, I actually have, I'm skeptical about whether it will be true for five or 10 years, right? In that case, then, I mean, you, you don't believe the long-term thesis of this company, then maybe just stay away. Uh, but what I'm trying to say is that at least for the single companies that you own, and then you want to bet on it on the, over the long term, you need to ask yourself, are they, you don't, do they have any things that you, you don't have to check every quarter to, to you know, uh, validate your own assumptions because you believe that it is true. Like, like, and, and I think that the stuff that I presented just now, right, the reason I think that they are true also because I follow them for quite a number of years. And, and I, I keep asking myself these questions like all this, is this true or not? And so far, um, still validated. I, I'll say the things that I just shown, right, uh, these are the trend that will continue. That's why um, owning Tesla to me, although the share price might, might have dropped, I, I'm comfortable holding. Um, so because of the long-term, this is still intact. All right, let's uh, move on to the second company, uh, which is Apple. Okay, uh, I think it has been quite some time uh, since I last discussed uh, Apple in length. Uh, let's walk through the earnings first. Okay, you can see that the revenue um, since, you know, like during COVID period until now, it has been going up, but over the recent uh, one to two years has been stagnant, uh, the revenues. Uh, similar picture for operating income. Uh, really, you can see that there's some stagnant there, but I think the company is making $118 billion, um, dollars, right? I think this is the company. They are still, you know, make a lot of money. So the question is, what's not going to change in the next 10 years for Apple? Okay, I think this is also interesting, right? Okay, to me, I've, Four points here. Okay, the first one is that company will keep on focusing, creating the best product. I, if you look around, right, I think not all companies uh, can actually say that their, their goal, right, or their vision is just to make the best product, right? You, you, you don't sense this kind of, um, this kind of, you know, culture or this kind of mindset in every company. Say, for example, you know, like Amazon. Amazon don't, they don't say they focus on making the best product. 
that's not in their in their you know like DNA. But for Apple, since uh, Steve Jobs' times until now, right, all they have been focusing, all they've been doing, right, like they do different things, they do acquisitions, they do R and D, they do a lot, a lot of things. But come back, right? I mean, their their visions is always like they want to make the best product. Later, we we'll go get into more uh, like examples, right? One one for example is the Vision Pro. You can see that the difference between uh, how Apple make their products versus, for example, like uh, Meta, right? So so they they are very different. And then second thing is uh, customer loyalty will not change, okay? This one, I, will, I have sense that customers uh, who are happy, you know, using iPhone, they've been using, uh, when they change phone, yes, they will change, but they will change to another iPhone, you see? The, lo- the loyalty will stop. So all this will, uh, is quite unlikely to change. La. Then, uh, we, of course, with all this loyalty and because Apple continue to make the best product, they, they will always have the pricing power, right? And this is always good for, for financial. And then the fourth one is that this is the one that uh, get, getting uh, more and more obvious is that you look at their patterns or you look at their styles, right? Is that they, they will want to own and control all the primary technology in everything they do. So I think this is uh, their style. They, they, there's a bit like control freak uh, in a way, but in a good way. La. But um, of course, I think this will actually help them to become like the best uh, maker of the product that they want to make. Uh, I think this is also very, very important. We'll get into more details in, in the following slides. Okay, of course, uh, the first one, Apple Vision Pro. I think uh, Apple is not the first one that come up with all this uh, VR headset, right? So if you look at uh, companies like Meta, they've been producing all these products. And it's not just one product coming from uh, Meta, right? They've been iterating on it for, for quite some time. Uh, but you don't sense the kind of, you know, like the the vibes that Apple gives, right? Um, suddenly, they just come up with the Vision Pro and, and people get a bit crazy about it. Like, you just scroll on, on you know, like X, uh, you can see that people already wearing their headset and, and, and uh, walk across the street, right? Uh, there's always these, these things, these vibes that is very different when, when uh, Apple coming up with a new products. So the question is, is Apple Vision Pro really like so much better compared to uh, like the Meta Quest, right? That, that's the thing that, that you have to assess, like, like what, what's the difference between two of them, right? For example, like uh, Meta, when they create a product, it's not like the first thing they think of is to make the best product. Because if you want to make the best product, right, the components, cost, everything you need to factor in, and then the, the price will be so high that it's very hard to go mainstream. That's why they intentionally create something that is uh, like more affordable so that any people who are interested with the uh, using a VR headset, they, they will just buy it, uh, and try it out, right? Uh, and, and the price is very cheap and you can try it out and it, if it's not fun and then you just put it somewhere and, and it's not a big deal. But for, for Apple, if they have to make a, like a subpar products, right? They would rather not make it. So if they make it, they want to make it make sure that it is the best. And you can see that, you know, Vision Pro is a very good example here. It's like, I don't know. I mean, in Sing dollars, it's maybe five to six thousand dollars. It's freaking expensive. But still, they, they to, to them, it's like price is, is not a problem, but we want the best products. So you can sense that here, right? Even with the cost of maybe um, they, they might not able to hit mainstream over the coming, let's say, three years, right? Because of the price. But they are fine with that, you know? So you can see that the DNA is strong, right? Then, of course, whether it's good or bad, uh, sometimes we need to do due diligence on this, I think. But good thing about, about um, uh, uh, like all this due diligence is that if you are interested with tech, right, you can always go to YouTube. And then even if you don't have, uh, you haven't experienced it yourself, you can just watch and, and just get a sense of it. Now. Of course, uh, all these things, the best due diligence is that you yourself have to use it directly and then you know whether the product is good or bad, right? So I'm looking forward to... Uh, to have every uh, Vision Pro arrive in Singapore so that I can try it out. But in terms of whether I'm going to buy one, I think unlikely, la, at least for the next two to three years. Uh, even Apple Watch also, I don't have, I only have an iPhone now. But as an investor, I would want to know whether they are producing the best products, right? So at least, because this is my long-term thesis. Now talking about like all these, you know, the best product, and if, as long as you produce the best products, right? Then in terms of pricing power, you can, you can actually charge a high enough price to make sure that you, you have good enough profit margin. And you can see the apples, right? Since, you know, like 2015 until now, you look at their uh, profit margins, it's like 45, uh, used to be, you know, about 38%. Now it went up to 45% because of all these service uh, services, right? So I think all this really, um, they, they want to make sure that at least on the premium rate tier, right? They will always uh, be, be uh, dominant. So there's a bit like a luxury attached to these uh, tech uh, companies, right? 
Now, of course, like uh, if you look at the financial, it's always helpful. And with all the financials, uh, they will just you know like use the money and then do share buyback and so on, and they will just retire the shares, right? And so I think this is very helpful um, in supporting the share price because anyone who are looking at you know like they looking for growth, they won't buy Apple because you can see that that growth already tapered down. And so there might be people who, who are cashing out, right? But as long as the company is still generating tons of free cash flow and they use the free cash flow to keep on buying from the secondary markets, the, the share price is hard for it to drop uh, given that this kind of strong buying from the company itself, right? So I think this is also something that offset factors that is concerning, which is growth. Then talking about the culture, I would say that sometimes culture, because we are all not working in apples, right? Sometimes it's a bit hard to judge the culture from outside. So sometimes I think my, my source is that I will go into like all this interview and listen in details. And just, just from, from the stuff that uh, all these, you know, that their executives are sharing, right? You can see that whether um, the culture that they have, right, is that something that's in line with, with what you have, right? So this, these uh, conversations with, um, Johnny Stroji and John Tenus, well, very hard to pronounce their names. Uh, I think this is very, very in interesting. You can see that um, they explain like why they, they um, you know, decided to design their own chip. is isn't so much about like design chip for the sake of design, designing chip, right? It's that they want to make sure that they have all this capability in-house so that they don't have to rely on other companies. Because before, for example, like Mac, right? Before they uh, switch from Intel to their own uh, Apple design chip, right? They have to, you know, like uh, rely on uh, on Intel, and Intel's uh, R and D and their their product advancement also is something. It's not something that on par with Apple. So, do you want to keep on continue rel relying on someone else, or you just have to, you know, bring all this in house and do it yourself, right? So you can see that Apple that definitely they have the uh, cap capability and capacity. They have the capital. So they will just all use all this to pro pour into R and D and make sure that they are one of the best. Uh, chip design companies in the world, right? So I, I think this one, uh, the chip design part is only one of them. Actually, if you look at different verticals, right? Say, for example, when it comes to Apple uh, marketing, uh, Apple's uh, R&D, their, their engineering, uh, all these things is very unique in, in a way that they, they want to have control on, on, on many of their uh, core technologies. So I think this is definitely something that will help them, you know, like um, to, to stay competitive and always be the one that produce the best product whereas others right other companies because of like you know they don't have the premium vibe to it so sometimes it's harder for them to justi justify a higher price so they, they just have to like you know cut prices and go mainstream and that's why the the, the segment outside of the premium right um the, the mainstream one yes maybe they're selling more uh, phones uh, more vr compared to apple but the profits, right, on those excitement isn't as high as the segment that Apple is operating in. So I think that's also something that, that's uh, interesting to, to pay attention to. So all this culture, I would say it, it will stick. Uh, and I have even much higher conviction after listening to all this interview. And, and so I, I think Apple is always a, a long-term hold for me. All right, that's on Apple. Uh, let's get into TSMC. Okay, revenue also same pattern. You can see that uh, I think this is uh, about 2021 and 2022. This is a period where they keep on uh, raising prices and, and then um, there's uh, all this, you know, cheap demand also getting a lot higher. But recently, um, I would say the recent one year or so, you can see that there's really like a recession uh, in, in semicon industry. And still, uh, TSMC is holding up well. Uh, revenue, although dropped a little bit, but uh, still, still quite uh, decent. And if you look at their operating income, it's still uh, the same, uh, like similar pattern. But one thing interesting about TSMC is that they mentioned that in terms of the capex, uh, their capex already uh, is, is expected to slow down over the coming quarters. And so what it means is that there will be more free cash flow to be distributed to the, to the uh, shareholders. And they already increased their uh, dividend payout. And they mentioned that uh, they, they will, you know, their dividend payout will only step up and, and not step down. So that's the commitment that they have made. So I think that's definitely a good news to the shareholders uh, because instead of like taking all these revenues and pour into machine, machine and keep on putting in capex, now they can harvest some of these capex. Okay, questions. <laughs> What's well, not going to change over the next 10 years, right? Okay, this is talking about their philosophy and some of them is like their principles. The first one is, they, TSMC say that they will never compete with their customers. 
you you think that this is sounds like I mean for those who are not familiar with TSMC, right? You, you are thinking how come like compete with customer? Apple also don't compete with their customers, right? But you notice that in semicon in industry, uh, this is actually quite a unique thing, sir. Okay, uh, in unique in a way like TSMC is unique, but other companies, right? You you look at this sentence, you 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 question yourself, is that true, or you need to sometimes worry whether the supplier is will be competing with you, you know? Okay, the second one is that the dominant scale will always drive efficiency, and the third one it is always uh, there will be advancement in technology. We'll get into more details. Okay, let's get a little bit into like like the basics of semicon uh, uh industry, right? So there's all this, you know, the left hand side what is what we call the fabless companies. These are the companies that's only design and they don't do the manufacturing. In fact, they don't have building that uh, semicon buildings that that you know like um, produce chips. They they pass it to uh, companies that have uh, um, you know fabs to to man manufacture all these chips, right? So the fabless is on the left hand side. In, in fact, Apple is one of them now because they design their own chip, right? And they don't manufacture. They pass it to companies like TSMC to do the manufacturing. And for companies like uh, TSMC, SMIC, UMC, Global Foundries, these are the companies that only do manufacturing, they don't do the design. And of course, there's companies like Intel and Samsung because they design their own chip. For example, Intel, you know, like the, or, or, or your uh, computer in Intel chip, these are the ones that design and manufactured by Intel. And for companies like Samsung, of course, they, they design their chip and then they, they manufacture their own. At the same time, they also, you know, like manufacturing, uh, chips for companies that only do the design. Say for example, I think sometimes you know like MD, Nvidia, they also pass some some of the chip design to Samsung to, uh, for manufacturing. So they, they are in in between. They they have both uh businesses now, the design part and also the ma manufacturing one. Okay, the question is right. You see companies like TSMC, they can say that uh all these fabulous company could be Nvidia, could be Apple, could be you know Qualcomm, they pass to TSMC the IP of those chips right. Is that they say you focusing on the design, I focusing on the manufacturing. We don't we don't have overlap, so there's no conflict of interest there. So we, we stay clear of like the waters, right? It's like my part is my part, your part is your part. But if you pass your design to Samsung or to Intel for manufacturing, right? Actually, the design that you pass to them, you don't know whether they will use discount IP for their own benefits in their own products, right? So there's inherent conflict of interest. Of course, if you ask Intel and Samsung, they will say there will be guardrail. Uh, your your uh, you, there will be safeguarding so that to avoid these kind of things to happen. But still, um, there's always a risk there, right? So the trust will not be hundred percent. So that's why I think this one, even if let's say companies like Intel or Samsung, they they can come up with uh products uh, or, or come up with uh, manufacturing that is even better than TSMC. But still, um, there are companies that will say that, okay, just because the trust is not 100%, um, just stick with TSMC. Uh, one good example is the Apple. Their partnership with TSMC, TSMC is that there's only one supplier for, for all their chips. That's so much trust that uh, Apple have on TSMC because they don't have to worry about other, other um, you know, like trust issue and so on. And of, of course, uh, TSMC also has been proven a very reliable partner when it comes to manufacturing. Because um they 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 have always have discussion in terms of like um expecting how much sales how much chips order that that's coming from Apple and so on and once TSMC um get the message from Apple that they need this kind of uh production capacity right they will just build up the fabs and and keep keep on delivering so I think that the trust in terms of uh like protecting their IP and also the trust of uh meeting their demand their orders. All, all this trust, right, take times to build and TSMC really have like, you know, one of the, I'll say the, really the strongest uh, uh, trust ranking. Uh. So I, I think this one, right, is embedded in the culture. It's not going to change. Uh. Of course, you know, like all these good things that I, I just mentioned, right, you can see that uh, when, when it comes to foundry market, TSMC, I, I think this is 2021 numbers. The If you look at 2022, 2023 numbers, uh, it's not, it's even higher than 54%. I believe the number is like, uh, 60 plus percent uh, in, in the um, total uh, share of foundry market and if you're focusing on those like leading edge market right uh, for example like the 5 nanometer 3 nanometer and, and more advanced one TSMC uh, their, their percentage right, is even higher it's, it's like you know like close to 100% kind of higher so this is because of all this trust and also because of the technology for semicon technology I think sometimes it's very hard for us to, to look beyond let's say like uh, five years ten years but at least uh, what we, we are we can be sure of is that they are leading now 
um, I would say that Samsung and Intel isn't that far behind. Uh, that means TSMC can't afford to you know be stagnant. At least for now, their yield and also their um, you know their process note technology is still one of the best one, and they are still pouring money into R and D and make sure that they stay as as the strongest one, as the most advanced one when it comes to uh, manufacturing. And one good thing about like all this scale that I just mentioned, right, like fifty four percent, and when it comes to leading edge, close to like you know ninety to hundred percent, is that they have a lot of orders and any engineering, any uh, R and D that put into into you know like uh, all this advancement, right? They will just spread up all these fixed costs to like huge orders, right? So all these business will require huge scale in order to to work. And TSMC really they have a strong scale there, and and so I think. The scale won't erode within, you know, like one or two years. The scale will probably be dominant for many, many years. And of course, you can keep on monitoring over the next one, two, three, five years, just to make sure that they are still maintaining the, the scale. Because sometimes all this scale, right, if the management do the wrong things, also it will deteriorate over time. Say, for example, at one point, uh, Intel is the one that have the dominant uh, uh, scale. But because of the mismanagement and so on, they, they, their scale is deteriorating. But uh, that's why you still need to watch. But you don't have to watch, uh, you know, every every quarters. These are the things that play out very slowly, uh, and so you don't have to, you know, like spend uh, so much time. Uh, for, for example, for myself, I I just glance through and and get a few data points. I, I'm sure that okay, at least this long term thesis is still uh playing up, and and I just sit back, right? Of course, uh, you look at the financials, it's all good. Uh, as long as you see the green bar here is fat, that's good now. So they have a lot of profits. But uh, for TSMC, one, one thing uh, special about it is that sometimes even though the gross profit is very high, but let's say if they have to put in a lot of capex, right, uh, their free cash flow can drop to negative. So that's something to, to pay attention to. But the good thing is that uh, recently uh, they, they say that the capex don't have to sustain for, for that kind of like high capex over the past few years, right? So, so at least um, that's, that's good for free cash flow perspective. Okay, that's uh, TSMC. Three more companies to cover. Uh, let's move on. The next one, Microsoft. Okay, this is their numbers. If you look at their numbers, right, you notice that comparing Microsoft versus all the others, right, I think their financial is just like fantastic. You can see that um, since 2015, right, just like one line straight up. And it's very, very, how to say, predictable kind of up, right? Now the revenue is already at $230 billion. If you look at their profit uh, on this is operating income, it's like 100 billion of operating incomes. And you can see that the, the tick, right, you see it's still increasing. And this increase, right, if you just project forward, it's still, still going to go up because after the uh, Activision um, buyout, right, all this will help up with their operating income over the coming quarters. So I think definitely these are a these are, uh, good picture to, to see here. Uh, their financial is just fantastic. Okay, now the question is, uh, what's not going to change for the ten, next 10 years, right? So I'll just name a few here. Uh, the first one is very, very high switching cost. Um, the second one, you can look at the trend, which is that Azure is keep winning the, the market share. And then the third one, uh, which is the in quite quite interesting one that I just uh, saw recently and I just want to share, which is that they uh, Microsoft actually owned the entire modern developer experience. So let's get into the details, right? So in terms of their business, right, for, for those who haven't paid much attention to Microsoft, their, their business lines right, is actually very diverse. It's not like just one product, right? It's, it's, they have multiple business lines. To the extent that if you read their transcript, right, sometimes it's, qu it's quite hard to follow because they will really go down into all these lines and talk about like, okay, are they growing well? Are they, what house they are operating profit and so on. So there's just too many of them. Uh, sometimes I won't pay too much attention to, to all the small ones, like just maybe focus on the big one is enough. So now the big one is Azure Cloud, uh, 53 billion, and then their Office 365 and Windows, this is 40 and 23 billion uh, re uh, respectively. And for Xbox, LinkedIn, these are like 15 and 10 billion, right? So this is the, the big uh, business line uh, that they have. So the one that I want to mention is that the switching cost, right, is that it's very, very hard to move up on. For example, if a company, they're using, for example, they're using Azure for their cloud, right? Just to switch to another another cloud uh, providers, right? It's very 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 difficult. Maybe some of them, let's say they can, they want to use multi, uh, multiple cloud providers. They will just carve out portions, and then uh, for certain portion, they will rely on the other cloud. But the one that you already using Azure, you want to switch to another provider. This is very very difficult. Uh. 
And then of course for Office 365 and window, Windows operating system, right? This is even harder to switch out. You can see that for, I think for most of these enterprise that they are, they are operating on Office, right? You, you ask them, can they actually switch to Apple and, and assume that, okay, they are in, uh, interchangeable, right? Actually the answer is like a clear no because there are many, many software that has been written on um, all this Windows platform and they, they, they only appear on Windows platform, right? So companies switch out to, to for example, like a Mac uh, system, right? Operating system, right? They, they, can, they can't even function. So the, all this, right? Because of, you know, like the, between the software and the operating system and because of the user, they all already tied up and it's, it's like this thing is very rigid and, and it's almost impossible for companies to switch from one operating system to the others. Uh. So I think this one alone, right, will, will just say that, okay, whatever, at least whatever profits that they are generating from all these businesses, right, their server business, their office, their, their windows, regardless of whether it's like recession or not, right, I think uh, companies like Microsoft, they are very, very solid. They don't have to worry much, right? Because company, they will have to continue to pay Microsoft to continue to use all these, you know, Office and Windows. That alone is like something that uh, enough to say that you don't have to pay too much attention, right? Of course, I, if you ask like during the recession, what are the stuff that could be affected, right? Of course, there are others, for example, like, you know, like search advertising, maybe LinkedIn, if there are less people looking for jobs or there's job recessions, um, all these might be affected. At least the core uh, business lines, they are, they are very, very strong. So I think this is uh, things that, I mean, 10 years, um, close eyes, no worries, you know. Of course, same things, look at their uh, Q4 income statement, you can see that, I mean, the green, the green bar is very, very fat because of all this pricing power. And, and business lines are all shown here, right? They are also very diverse, right, like I mentioned. It's not like one single product that, that drive the entire returns. You can see that uh, cloud provider market share trend, right? If you look at Microsoft, just just how many years? This is uh five, maybe five or six years ago. They are only at fifteen percent. Right now, they are close to twenty five percent. So you can see that it's very clear that this blue line is continue to go up. The one that is going up is only Microsoft and Google. In fact, even Amazon, which I um like, like I'm very bullish on Amazon. Still, uh, in terms of the market shares is going down, but they are still the dominant one. Uh, but just that in terms of the trend, they are they are going down. Uh, the rest, right, you see uh, Adibaba, IBM, Oracle, and all the others, right, I think they are slowly losing market shares to, to the big one, for example, like, like Microsoft or Google. Uh, the, the one main reason is because I think that all these cloud business, right, they are not high, super high profit margin business, but uh, they are a scale business, meaning that if you don't have the scale, you just can't, can't compete with the, the other providers. So the big one will continue to win. Uh, and I expect that companies, for example, like Amazon, uh, uh, Microsoft, Google, they, these three will continue to win market shares. Uh. At least that's uh, my expectation for, for the next 10 years. Of course, the last one, talking about the uh, modern developer experience. Okay, first thing I want to caveat is that I'm not developer. So all these things, I've heard about them. Uh, some of them I've used it, but I'm definitely not, not like, uh, don't know the details. But at least for, for you, you can go to, you know, like, um, go to Twitter, X, just to read out ab about all this, right? You can see that actually uh, Microsoft, they are almost like end-to-end. -end. They, are, they are everywhere, right? From, you know, like software stack to all the hardware. They are everywhere. So you see, just a list of names here, right? Uh, uh, GitHub, this is the main VCS. VCS is the vision control system, I think. So GitHub, uh, they own the entire GitHub, right? So, and then they have all this uh, package registry, NPM. VS Code, the best code editor, and then Copilot, the most popular AI helper, then Azure, one of the top cloud providers. So not to mention ChatGPT and LinkedIn, you see? They have legs in all these key verticals here. So I think this is how they make sure that they, they, are, they, they will be uh, dominant. And of course, from the share price, in fact, uh, Microsoft just surpassed Apple as the largest market cap, right? So I'm really not surprised uh, of that, uh, just to, to see um, their successes in, in like different line of business. Okay, that's on Microsoft. Uh, let's move on to Amazon. Amazon also the interesting one. You look at the revenues, keep on going up and up and up and up. Look at the numbers here. It's $554 billion uh, last 12 months. You know, like half trillions. <laughs> that, that's a crazy kind of numbers. Uh. When it comes to operating income, it's a bit uh, like not a straight line. As you can see here, during, um, you know, like 2023, we have, where, where they face all these, you know, overcapacity issues, right? They, they build out too much logistic. 
it's too much spend uh, in all these fulfillment uh, warehouses and so on. Their, their operating income actually dropped like quite significantly. And now because of all this, you know, like cutting costs and so on, they, they, uh, in terms of their operating income, it's already back to all-time high. So definitely for those uh, who held through this period, uh, congrats fellow bet holders that now get, can get can show some good results. But still, I think in terms of their price, it still, it still haven't like, you know, performed as well as Microsoft. Uh, but okay, for Amazon, what's not going to change, right? In fact, the quote, right? The what not going to change also come from Bezos. So what I did is that I just uh, stole quite like, like a number of, of things that uh, Bezos mentioned, right? So when, when, when he said that, the interesting questions of not what's not going to change, right? He mentioned three things only about the customer because uh, like I mentioned, right? Apple is a company that pay a lot of attention to the product. Uh, Amazon is the companies that pay a lot of attention to the customer. So there's some slight differences there. So, and from Bezos perspective is that customer always want cheap, fast and vast selection. So you see everything they do, right? always uh, revolve around these three things how to make their services cheaper faster and provide more options to the customers then of course uh with with this uh their scale will continue to go up as you look at their revenue chart you, you can uh, you can see that right focus on the customer this is really in their dna and then of course uh, invention in fact this is something that um, uh, Bezos talked a lot about you can read his book at to, to get some you know appreciation on on the invention partner I think all this right is is like one big part of their five wheel okay we'll get into the five wheels okay now just get one examples right you can see that Amazon logistic in terms of the market share of parcel volume right you can see that this red uh, no, this black line here Amazon logistic from 2018 to 2020 it's really like it went out crazy. Now it's at 23%. It's actually larger than FedEx. You can see that their logistic business, although it's just like small part, it's not even the part that is like dominant, right? But still, it's huge, right? So, and all these things is not to say that, okay, I want to buy Amazon because of their logistics. It's not like that. What I want to pay attention to is that, you know, why are they building all these logistics uh, and do their own delivery, right? It's because they want to make sure these things if they don't have their own logistic, they have to rely on FedEx uh, and other providers. And sometimes they are fed up because of this. Maybe it's not fast enough, it's, it's not cheap enough. Um, so they have to do it themselves to make sure that they, 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 push, they push the entire, you know, all these uh, parcel delivery providers to, to you know, work harder. So they, they actually spend a lot of money in this. But one thing that coming out is that in terms of the, you know, like the delivery speed uh, and, and coverage, right? They, they provide the best customer experience. Uh. So, so that's the, the goal and that's really embedded in their DNA. Of course, this is talking about uh, US uh, market share. They are the dominant one and at uh, 38%. The rest, right, all these um, small ones, small e-commerce, uh, Walmart, eBay, they are very, very small. So I think this dominant uh, market shares always provide a scale to them. And if you look at their revenue, just like I showed that, uh, it's like you know, 500 plus billion uh, revenues uh, in one year, right? Uh, Walmart, is, Walmart is still above and I my prediction is that in just a couple of short years uh, Amazon is going to overtake Walmart uh. so you can mark my words here so they will always grow <laughs> okay so now talk about the five wheel right so why why all this you know talking about like just focus on the customer why focus on you know uh, provide the best pricing and so on why are all these so important it's because of this five wheel the first is that they want to attract men, like as much traffic as possible, they want to attract uh, customer to their platforms. And because once the customer is there, they will have the sellers. And once the sellers are there, they will have a lot of selection. Many sellers selling there means that uh, they will provide uh, like different options to the customer. And this will help with the customer experience, right? Because they, they get to choose. Uh, unlike, let's say, some niche uh, e-commerce platforms, uh, customer log in, they don't have much uh, options. They won't go, go back, right? So in this case, I think Amazon, because of their vast selections, they provide very, very good uh, customer experience. Once this start to turn, right, they will start to grow, right? The, the business will start to grow. They will uh, achieve scale. And that growth, right, will, actually, will lower down the cost structure. And by having a lower cost structure, they will have a lower prices. And lower prices is always, always something that the customer like to see. And they will be happy. And once the customer happy, they will come back and they will boost up the traffic again. So this flywheel it will keep on turning and turning. And this kind of flywheel, right, it's not like every company can achieve, right? So only the big one will achieve this kind of scale. 
So if you look at uh, US e-commerce, right, Amazon already have a flywheel that keep turning around for many, many years. They will win and continue to win. And if you look at AWS, right, uh, their cloud uh, service, right, is that it's the same thing. So it's like more, more traffic driving down the cost structure and then they will keep continue to lower the price and then lower prices give the best customer experience. And, and you, once you have invention uh, within this ecosystem, right, it will just provide the best product to the customer. And these are the stuff that is very, very hard for other, you know, other providers to, to come in to, and to eat your market shares. It's very, very difficult. Okay? You, you need another like, equally big you know, providers. For example, in, in the case of AWS, um, you, you have you know, Azure, which is you know, Microsoft. They have the enough capi uh, capital and then capability to, to, to come and uh, eat the market shares. Right? Whereas for other, other areas, you can see that other competitors actually find hard to compete uh, right? once you have a flywheel that's turning. This is a bit similar to like, the network effect, but there's some slight differences between these two concepts. Uh. Okay, next one, uh, like uh, this is their financials. You, you notice that their operating profits, right, uh, isn't as high as, uh, for example, like Microsoft and Apple. Uh, this is because for Amazon, although, you know, in terms of scale, right, they have 500 billions of uh, revenue, but those uh, businesses, right, they, their margin isn't as high, okay? Uh, but one good thing is that only, only Amazon can operate at this scale, and if you, although it's like small, slim margin but because of the revenue will keep on going up right so they will still be you know the profit will still increase over time but it is not a high profit margin uh. this is like a scale business that 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 uh margin percentage is a bit smaller compared to to the others okay let's continue with uh nvidia uh revenue to the moon uh, i think i showed this uh, last week also and then operating income is like also to the moon uh, to the moon it's 20 billion now i think or over the next 12 months or so you can see that this number will likely double to about 30 to 40 billions okay did you look at their profit margin this is like just fantastic profit margins you can see this green bar is super super fat but if you compare their revenue right in just like you know the recent quarter their qu their revenue is like 20 billion so you can see that the scale right 20 billion let's call it like 80 billions a year, right? It's still, it's still very small as compared to companies like uh, Apple, Microsoft. So in terms of scale, they are, they are still not as big. Okay, in terms of their business line, you can see that data center is the biggest one because of all these AI, um, you know, uh, products that they are selling. The others are, are rather sm uh, small. Uh, what's not going to change over the next 10 years? Okay, number one is always AI, AI, AI. So the this generative AI trend will continue to play play out uh, over the next five to ten years and then uh, their focus is on the ecosystem on the silicon on the hardware the software and then the strong partnership um, this has been true and it will continue to be true and then you, you, if you follow like um, the companies you'll notice that they, they have very aggressive cadence of new products meaning that you can see every uh, ev i think on, on every six months they will, be, they, they will have this gtc and then uh, you notice that they keep on coming up with new products okay so that's uh, something that's interesting. And then the last one, uh, which is also thing very interesting, is that Nvidia gets it, but others still catching up. Uh. So you can you can see whether you agree on, on this or not. And maybe those who, who are long AMD may not be that happy uh, looking at this last line, right? But still, let's get into some details, right? Okay. So talking about AI, right? I would say that now AI is still new. In fact, we have been using ChatGPT for not that long, right? Although it felt that uh, they've been around for quite some time. I would say let's think about this uh, AI from like use cases point of view. And if you look at the list here, right? From customer ex uh, experience, supply chain, human resource, fraud detection, knowledge creation, research and development, customer service, predictive analytics, all these, right? It are just like, you know, areas uh, that people are using okay but so far most of these um, use cases right they don't have ai embedded in but we know that over the next five to ten years right you will see that ai will get into all these different fields and it will become something that's normal one thing we are quite uh, at least i myself i'm quite assured of is that nvidia will be everywhere because it will be infused right in, into all these different use cases so just just pay attention to, to the product that you use. Uh, like you will you definitely notice more and more AI coming up. Uh. Then of course, um, I mean, uh, Nvidia is not the only providers, right? So why are they so dominant, right? So this one I would say it is getting a bit more uh, technical. 
Uh, but for those who are interested, I right, suggest you uh, go, go and read about these things called CUDA. So this is like a NVIDIA a pair of computing platforms and um, they have quite a number of like all these libraries uh, and, and different developer tools. What this thing's trying to achieve is that anyone that, I mean all these researchers, right, like AI researchers, as long as they have um, like the NVIDIA chip uh, or NVIDIA, you know, like the, the GPUs, right? And then with that come with all these CUDA libraries, and with that libraries, right, they can straight away, you know, like coming up, like, like solve the, the problem that they're solving, right? That's the mo most important, uh, important thing, right? You just need to measure, like, for example, if you give like the world-class uh, AI researchers and you say, okay, do everything that you need, but you cannot use anything that is NVIDIA. Like you cannot use, use CUDA, uh, take away the CUDA, take away the, the um, NVIDIA GPU uh, and just, just see how much their productivity will drop, right? So because of all these uh, libraries, these are software stuff, right? Once you don't have the library, then you basically need to reinvent many, many of this library to, to just uh, do, do your things, right? The productivity will just like, you know, collapse, right? That's why it doesn't matter like uh, all this like N NVIDIA GPU, it's very expensive, everyone know about it, but still uh, comparing to the cost of recreating all this library in another platforms, right? Still, uh, I think NVIDIA is still the best propositions, right? That's why their market shares is like, you know, 100% uh, at least for, for all the AI use cases. Okay, this is talking about the GTC, um, like for those who, who, who are doubting, you know, for, for example, like Apple, they have, you know, iPhone every year, right? And then for most of the products, you, you, we are used to every year, like, like a yearly refresh. But when it comes to NVIDIA, right? You notice that, hey, how come the last GTC is not too long ago, suddenly there's new GTC coming up, right? And you see, the, the upcoming one is March, which is, now it's already February, right? Which is one and a half months uh, ago. Then there will be new product, could be gaming product, could be AI product, could be software stuff that they've, they've been working on and so on. So you can see that it's really, really, the cadence is very fast. And with that speed, right? Um, I really don't think other companies uh, is able to catch up. Uh. What, what it means is that at least in this AI field, right, um, it is likely that NVIDIA is continue to, to do, uh, dominate uh, because others just can't catch up. Uh, okay, I know this is uh, quite a long text here. I'm not going to read all of this. Actually, this is uh, um, you know, taken from one of the interview that Jensen just, just said. I, I think it, it sounds a bit arrogant there, but uh, just I, I found it quite interesting to, to you know, listen to, to him, like seem co so confident to say that uh, NVIDIA is the, the only one that gets, gets it, uh, other don't still catching up. Nah, they basically, they, they, can't, they can't really compete with uh, NVIDIA on this. Nah. So there are a lot of startups, uh, and not non-startups, doing AI chips op optimized for LLMs. Uh, can you talk about, uh, and they claim to be dramatically more effective and energy efficient than yeah. GPUs. Can you talk about what you're planning in these regards? Yeah, um, for, first of all, th this is one of the great observations that we made. You know, we realized that, that um, deep learning and AI was, was not a chip problem. It's a reinvention of computing problem. Everything from how the computer works, how computer software works, the type of software that it was going to write, the way that we write it, the, the way we develop software today using AI, creating AI, that method of software is fundamentally different than the way we did it before. So every aspect of computing is, is changed. And in fact, one of the things that, that people don't realize is the vast majority of computing today is a retrieval model, meaning just all you have to do is ask yourself, what happens when you touch your phone? Um, some, ele you know, some electrons go to a data center somewhere, retrieves a file and brings it back to you. In the future, the vast majority of computing is going to be retrieval plus generation. And so the way that computing is done is fundamentally changed. Now, we, have, we observed that and realized that about a decade and a half ago. I think a lot of people are still trying to sort that out. It is the reason why you know, we're, people say we're, we're practically the only company doing it. It's probably because we're the only company that got it. And people are still trying to get it. You can't, you can't solve this new way of doing computing by just designing a chip. Every aspect of the computer has fundamentally changed. And so everything from networking to the switching to the way that the computers are designed to the chips itself, um, all of the software that sits on top of it and the methodology that pulls it all together, uh, it, it's, um, uh, it's a big deal because it's a complete reinvention of the computer industry. And now we have a trillion dollars worth of data centers in the world. 
all of that's going to get retooled. That's the amazing thing. We've got, we're in the beginning of a brand new generation of computing. It hasn't been reinvented in 60 years. This is, a, this is why it's such a big deal. It's, it's hard for people to wrap their head around it, um, but that's, that's the, um, that was the great observation that we made. It's, it includes a chip, but it's not about that chip. Jensen Wong, everybody, thank you very, very much. Thanks, everybody. Okay, thank you so much for watching the video. And if you like the sharing, feel free to, uh, you know, like put, put your comment in the um, videos. And then uh, remember to like the videos and then share it to your friends who, who might be interested uh, with, with all this uh, research here. Uh, and see you in the next one. See you. Bye-bye.